I've mentioned Open Collector before in one of the Logic Gate chip videos. Collector as in the collector of a transistor. The base to emitter junction is the control junction and the collector to emitter junction is the throughput junction. So effectively, the collector is the output of both an NPN and a PNP transistor used in the normal way. Open Collector is basically a circuit where instead of having a voltage output, the output is a connection to a collector of a transistor so it drives a load directly. And this has different uses in logic gates, but in this case, the reason I'm doing it with the oscillator is so that I can plug something directly to be powered into the oscillator. It's separated by the PNP transistors, so it has a minimal effect on the circuit. It does have an effect, as I'll go over later, but it has much less of an effect than if I just had the two voltage points on the oscillator directly connected to the load. So let me show you the circuit. So the core of it is a standard oscillator, a stable multivibrator. No surprises here. We have our load resistors driving what would be the load here, such as an LED usually, through the charging end of the capacitor, through the transistor, and the other side of the capacitors cross-connected with the bases of the NPN transistors to do the oscillation with feedback throughout the circuit. There we go. But the load isn't in here. These are minimal resistors, and as a quick reminder, these resistors should be as small as possible, because when the capacitor is charging this way, the load will still be on. We want that to be very quick because the load is supposed to turn off. This capacitor is supposed to charge this way quickly and stop, which is what turns the load off. And also make sure that the capacitor is fully charged as the circuit gets ready to switch. The actual timing is this resistor through the capacitor discharging. Remember the RC network timing is both ways. It's the same time constant charging and discharging. So we want the primary timing to be as it discharges this way with the load on. And then when it starts charging, we want this to be fast and quickly turn the load off, as well as make sure this is charged so we're ready. So when the capacitor charges and we want it to stop, this will be fully charged to about 5 volts. So a high signal is when we want the load off. When this transistor is on, we want the load on, and this is connected through basically to ground. So we want a zero for the load being on. So naturally that implies PNP because it's reverse. So our two PNP transistors, in fact I need them out a bit further, so they're connected through power and I haven't printed two of the vertical loads yet so we'll just make do with this. This is the basic layout. So recall on the PNP transistor when the transistor is on, there's current flowing, conventional current flowing, from emitter to base. So emitter is high, base is low. So it's forward biasing the PN junction. And then through emitter to collector is the normal throughput current, which goes through the load. Whatever resistor is anything you want in here. So this right here, if I take this away, this one and the other one, this is what open collector means because the current splits emitter to base and emitter to collector. Open collector means this is an open circuit. There's nothing here. It's just a pin on the board or whatever. And then you plug your load into it. And so ideally, we want no resistance. We want a direct connection here through the load like this. And the load can take care of its own resistance. And on our spec sheet, we would say maximum current, maximum voltage, don't exceed that or you'll fry the thing. And then we can decide how much we want within that. But we do need some resistance beyond the load because if you look here, we have a path power through the emitter to base, through a junction, junction, collector to emitter, and negative, which means we have no explicit resistance through that particular path. So when this transistor is on, this transistor will be on as well because we'll have low here connected through low here, which will turn on the base. That's how this works and high there. So we do need a resistor and we'll put a resistor here. And this works well because we can have a different voltage drop for the emitter to base, which is just the turn on current. It's a necessary evil. And then a separate resistor. It's a separate voltage drop across the actual load. So we connect it like this. So when this transistor is on, we get zero through there, which means we're going to get zero through here, roughly. We'll have a low anyway. And this will be all always high, it's directly connected to power. A separate connection to power so the load can draw what it wants and it's not going to affect here. So the load increasing in its 
current is not majorly going to affect any of the rest of the circuit, as long as the power supply has enough amperage. So the first thing is I decided that I want mine to be supplied by 5 volts, and I want it to operate at 60 hertz. 60 hertz is what the wall power operates on around here, and 5 volts is convenient. I can just use a USB plug. Now, I could put potentiometers on there to make it a little more robust for working with variable voltages, but for this one I decided I'm going to make this a specific board. Anybody who wants different values can just use different values. So I calculated, and my resistors can handle a maximum of one quarter of a watt. So at five volts, to get one quarter watt gives us a minimum of 100 ohms. But voltages vary sometimes, current varies, and the resistor value varies. So for safety, I went up to the next value in my box. So these are 120 ohms, 120 ohms. These are the load resistors. Again, you want them as small as possible so that everything charges quickly. And and this does mean it uses more power. I have chosen to sacrifice power for robustness. So we'll be draining quite a bit through here, but it's not gonna be huge, on the order of 40 milliamps or so. And most wall warts I've seen can draw about 650 milliamps or so, at least 500. So it's wasteful, but it's well within the specs of normal hardware you'll have lying around. And the actual load will be using a different power supply anyway. So it can have its own rating. This is just the logic power, essentially. For these resistors, I've used potentiometers to try and figure out what the optimum value is, because this is not a standard design, so there's no handy formulas out there. I'll show you the effect that has when I show you the circuit. So the idea to get 60 hertz, if we remember our formula, and I'll just write it here and say it out, natural log of two times two times R times C, all of this divided into one, take the reciprocal. This is your frequency. R is the value of these resistors. C is the value of these capacitors. And then the rest is constants. This is the rough formula that works when these load resistors are very low. And recall in addition that an oscillator is supposed to give you more of a curve like this, where there's kind of a ramp up, because as the capacitor charges, it goes from low to high and then stays high for however long, right? And we want this to be sharper, really, you know, having this resistor smaller will make it sharper. But when this is sitting charged at around the power supply voltage, the load is off. So it charges up and then the load turns off as it charges and the load is sitting off and then it immediately dives down when the capacitor is discharging and as it's sitting down here at zero, the load is on because the zero is coming from the throughput of the transistor. So the bottom of the load is connected to zero, the top is connected to power. So this is the bottom of the load. When the bottom of the load is high and the top of the load is high, that's a voltage of roughly zero across it. That's why the load is off. Voltage is a difference. So if the top is always connected high, you have to connect the bottom low to turn the load on. And that works the same way here. This is connected high. When this is high up here, then high to high, this is not forward bias transistors off and so forth. But when there is a large disparity, not a ridiculous one, but a large one, between the capacitor and the resistor, when the capacitor is smaller and the resistor is larger than the normal numbers you'll see on the internet, in fact, the more that disparity, bring down the capacitance, bring up the resistance, and you get the same value because you can see if you raise resistor and lower capacitor correctly, you can get the same result, frequency equals. But the more you do that, the more of a disparity you make, despite getting the same frequency value, the sharper it is. So you can get a nice square wave out of it. So I have chosen a one microfarad capacitor. These are one microfarad, which is definitely smaller than they normally would be. And if we solve for R from that formula, we get approximately 120 K ohms for both of these, 120 K ohms. So smaller capacitor than usual, larger resistor than usual, which does limit the switching time. Doing this limits how fast it can switch because higher resistance is slower changing of voltages. But this is 60 Hertz, not even kilohertz. This is 60 Hertz. This is completely inconsequential delay. Now I have used potentiometers here so you can just put it on the oscilloscope screen and turn the potentiometers to adjust the frequency by hand if you want. Just see how the curves do. I've shown you that in past videos, but the calculation comes out at about 120K. And then these, like I said, 
There's no formula for that, so I use potentiometers. The load is going to be my oscilloscope probes, which are 10 mega ohms each. But I'll show you the behavior I saw, but it's basically, there's two values here. There is a sweet spot for this resistor. If this resistor is indefinitely high, just more and more and more and more, then the timing of the circuit is basically not affected by its presence. There's a sweet spot and it's basically a curve, so it always affects it, but there's a spot at which it becomes noticeable, just like a capacitor technically never fully charges, but at a certain point we say, okay, it's fully charged. Same thing. There's a sweet spot at which there is a noticeable effect on the timing if you turn this down too far. So if you turn this down way, way, way low, it actually changes the timing of the whole thing, but you don't need much. You can turn it up just fine, and we don't need that to be high, and we don't want this to be high current anyway. A bigger resistor here is good because, again, this is wasted current. We just need it to turn the transistor on. Less power wasted is great, so having a higher resistor here is not a big deal. For the load, the interesting behavior is if the load resistance is high, then it doesn't affect the timing. The circuit still functions on the same frequency, but that curve, and I'll show you. So we want a nice square wave, but we actually get a curve like that. So with a low resistance of a load, as in a normal load, because a normal load is not going to be mega ohms. If you're inputting it into a microcontroller pin or an oscilloscope, it will be, but this is not really for that. An actual load is not going to have mega ohms. So we're going to get our nice square wave, but if you turn the load resistance high, it actually curves this out again. It counteracts somehow it counteracts that whole thing about having this be smaller and this be larger the disparity greater to make it more square having a high load even though pr in principle it shouldn't affect it but through the magic of quantum mechanics it does and it curves that back out again it undoes this disparity which i found interesting so let's actually look at it in action so i won't bother to show the oscillator on its own i've already done that in many videos just imagine a nice square wave there let me just clear that away so what i'm going to do is go ahead and turn on the voltage I have right now is 5 volts. So let me go ahead and turn up the current limit. And this is exactly what we want. Right now, I have here the two 120 ohm resistors, the load resistors. I have two NPN, they're two N3904 NPN transistors, and two PNP transistors that are the two N3906. Here I have the one microfarad capacitors. These resistors are the timing resistors. These are the 120K, although right now they're somewhere around like 10,500 just because I was adjusting them based on the oscilloscope screen, which is not a precision instrument. So when I'm replacing these with actual resistors, I would put in the 12Ks, but those are the timing resistors for the oscillator. These are the base resistors for the PNPs. They sit between the base of the PNP and the collector of the NPN to limit the control current that turns the load on and off. And finally, these are actually used to reduce the resistance of my oscilloscope probes because the oscilloscope probes are in series with the PNP transistor collector. That's what's connected to the collector. That's the load. But I have them in parallel with these resistors. So they have an effective parallel resistance with the same voltage drop because this is measuring voltage. And of course, this is one side and this is the other. It's the two different loads that are on and off at opposite times. So the first behavior I wanted to show you is if I take the resistors that are between the PNP base and NPN collector, and I turn them down, and down and down and down and down and down, you can see it affects the timing. And my milliamperage goes way up. Now, the interesting thing is that it's not reaching the current limit of my power supply with one of them all the way at zero. If I turn the other one also all the way to zero, then it reaches the current limit. And if I turn it up a little bit, there we go. So once again, with both of those resistors at zero, which should leave one path completely without any resistance besides the wires, I have a 100 milliamp limit right now, and it's drawing anywhere from 84, 83 to 87 milliamps. It's not limiting, it's at the full five volts. So something about these transistors is naturally being limited, even though the base current is completely 
completely unlimited. So there's details about transistors, BJTs in particular, I don't quite understand yet why this is not a short circuit. But that's interesting. But that's not what we want. If I take these, I turn them all the way up to whatever they are. I think they're 50k. I want to say this is 50k ohms on both. Now I'm going to wiggle one. See, I'm wiggling it like crazy. Nothing's happening. If I turn it down and down and down and down and down and down and down, all of a sudden, and I'll be careful, so it goes up, and if I turn it up and down right at the edge, you can see it wiggling a little bit, hopefully. But once I reach the point where it's not visibly wiggling, there's a lot left, and I turn it all the way up from there, and it didn't change it anymore. So that's what I mean about a sweet spot. So let me turn it down just until the point where it's visibly affecting it. So I'll wiggle it carefully, and then I'll wiggle the other one. We'll go down, 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 until about there. You can see it wiggling, so I'll turn it up a little bit. And now we're back down to about 44 milliamps over there like it should be. So right now I'm going to turn down the current to zero, and by turning the current down to zero, it should also be discharging the capacitors because they're still in the circuit. And then I'm going to use my multimeter here to measure the resistors. And let me actually turn my power supply all the way off in case there's a trickle, because it's not a precision instrument. But I'm going to measure what I have these resistors at. It's fine to have the oscilloscope on, that's passive. So this one is reading about 1185 ohms. So just like 1.2k ohms, 1200 ohms. The other one, because they won't be exactly the same, the other one is reading at 2.28k ohms, because these are 50k, so there's only so much precision I'm going to get with a screwdriver. So somewhere 1k, 2k-ish is the sweet spot for that system. So let me pull my multimeter out, turn the power supply back on, and you can see you don't need much, but the more is better. But if you wanted a low value to have faster switching for whatever reason, you could. So let me turn the voltage back up, or rather the current back up, and there we go. So that's the base resistor. You just have to have it at a certain value to not affect the timing. And the higher the better. Now the other thing, just turn these up a little bit more just to make sure it's completely unwiggly. I'll just turn them all the way up to 50k. Why not? Now, recall I have my oscilloscope probes connected as the load in parallel with these two resistors. Now watch when I remove them. Do you see that? I've removed the resistors. So this is just an open circuit. So now it's straight 10 mega ohm load and the timing did not change. Here, I'll even make it clearer. Let me put these back in or at least one of them, or I put this one in, you can see it curved on one side, but not the other. So it's completely independent. And if I pull this wire out and in and out and in and out and in, you can see all it's doing when the resistance is high, when the load resistance is very high, and this is fascinating, but when the load resistance is very high, let me put that in properly, it counteracts the disparity that we're using to curve. So if I turn these all the way down to zero, of course, the power supply is current limiting, we have a short circuit, blah, 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 because it's in parallel. So let me not turn them all the way down. Let me just turn them down enough. Down and down and down and down. So recall, before I do that, when you have a resistor, it has a certain resistance. If you add another resistor in parallel, that reduces the resistance. Remember the series in parallel formulas. So when you add a resistor in parallel, it reduces the resistance. But once you have the two together, then changing the value, if you increase one of the resistor's value, you don't change the number of resistors, but you increase one of the resistor's value, you're actually increasing the resistance. If you turn it down, you're decreasing it. So adding it drops the resistance, but then changing the value up and down changes the total resistance up and down like it should, except not with the same proportion it would in series. So when I remove it, I have increased the resistance to just the multimeter probe. When I put it back in, I have decreased the resistance. But now, if I decrease the resistance further towards a short circuit, you can see it starts affecting the system every time it goes into current limitation, but it doesn't affect it until then. Until the voltage of the supply drops, it's not having any effect. So the load resistance being high curves it. And I think you can even see if you look very closely. Yes, you can. I don't know. Here, let me zoom in. Let me get as tight as I can on one of these curves. So that's the green curve at the bottom. Let me check which one this is. It is that one. So look very closely 
at this little corner of the green curve. Can you see it's slightly curved? I'm going to turn up and down the resistor on the right side of the circuit. Down and up and down and up and down and up. Can you see the curve getting smaller when I turn it down and bigger when I turn it up? If I don't go to the short circuit point, so down and up and down and up and down and up. So this amount of curve is basically nothing. It's close enough to square wave to be still a square wave. But if we increase the resistance much more, then we're going to get that curve back. And I wouldn't really call that an issue because, like I said, a real load is not going to have high resistance. Think about speakers. Speakers have 4 to 8 ohms. And this is in the kilo ohm range once I've brought it down by parallel. Maybe closer to 1 meg. I haven't actually done the math, but it's not single digits. So it's not something that would actually affect the operation of the circuit, but it's interesting to note. And I'm thinking it might be connected to the fact that if I turn the base... PNP to collector NPN resistor down all the way to zero. It's not a short circuit because at that point there's single ohms of resistance throughout the whole thing and it should be blowing through my power and current limiting, but it's not. It uses a whole lot more, but it's not a short circuit. So I'm thinking something about the transistor that makes that not a complete short circuit is also what's going on here. That maybe the load is affecting the collector to emitter, or rather, since it's PNP, emitter to collector. And that limitation is also somehow limiting the base to emitter, or once again, emitter to base, since it's PNP. That is a subject for future study. But for now, I have a functional open collector 60 hertz 5 volt oscillator. And if you want to make your own at whatever particular frequency and voltage, all you have to do is make the load resistors as small as possible without blowing your resistors, use your formula to figure out, based on your capacitance, what resistance to use, bringing your capacitance down to a reasonable level to get that disparity to get the square wave, use at least a couple k ohms, or test with potentiometers even better, the PNP base to NPN collector resistors, the higher the better, to not affect the timing of your circuit, and then the load, the lower the better. So if you connect a mega ohm load, expect to get your curve back, but the timing will still work. But a real load, a low resistance load, a low impedance load, you'll still get your nice square wave with just a minimal curving. And considering it's 2018, nothing I did here is novel or interesting in terms of the science of electronics. I don't know if anyone's made a circuit like this. Basic Googling didn't find anything, but the internet is a vast place that is not perfectly in so I have no doubt somebody somewhere has come up with this idea. But this is technically the first circuit I have at least partially made myself. The oscillator is a cookie cutter from all over, but adding the PNPs in this way and figuring out the resistors, I did it. So yay, a milestone. So while I go celebrate, I'll be seeing you.